Thank you, Mark. I'd like to thank the Institute for Cognitive Sciences here at the university for sponsoring this extraordinary event, and a special nod of gratitude to Stephen Harned for his uh, unu unusual amount of work and skill in putting it all together. It's a great honor and a distinct privilege for me to talk to a summer school on the evolution and function of consciousness and to uh, direct our attention to another hard problem, as Mart said, uh, the ethics of using animals in research on consciousness. When Stephen invited me to come and talk, he said, and I quote, the, that he would like me to talk about the importance of how we treat feeling creatures irrespective of whether we can explain the causal function of feeling. And given the other emphasis of the papers at the meeting, I interpreted his question somewhat narrowly, and I set out to write a paper on the ethics of causing pain to non-human primates in order to answer philosophical questions such as, do monkeys have theory of mind? I was intrigued by work of Yuri Hassan at Princeton, who is showing students movies like Avatar here. He also shows them the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then sees what's happening in the brain. Since I'm interested in whether any animals have a theory of mind, and since having a theory of mind requires that one be able, as Aristotle first pointed out, to follow the twists and turns of a plot as it's being driven by the motives of its characters, I found Hassan's work fascinating in topographic mapping of a hierarchy of temporal receptive windows using a narrated story. He's shown that when we process words, these yellow areas light up, and then they remain in working memory as we process a sentence in the green areas, and my interest, the story, or narrative, paragraphs, uh, in, the, in the blue. Now what I wanted to know, and still want to know, is whether monkeys share these areas, areas that might be implicated in mind reading. And if they do, would we be justified in restraining them to study those parts of their brains? And finally, if they had those parts, would we be justified in causing them to become depressed, lesioning those parts of the brain that seem to be implicated in their having intrusive thoughts about the thoughts that other people are thinking about them, and finding out uh, whether such a procedure might relieve their symptoms. The results, I think, could have important clinical implications for the treatment of depressed humans, and they might help us understand a monkey's mental capacities. Stephen responded to my ideas as follows. You're asking important and valid questions, but there's a much wider context around all this, and as you are the only speaker at the Summer Institute who will be addressing this, I very much hope you won't admit, omit to mention this wider context. He went on to formulate the wider context in terms with which I largely agree, so with his permission, I'm going to quote him again. To be conscious means to feel, and to be able to feel is to be able to be hurt. Primates are not the only feeling creatures, and lab experiments are not the only hurt being imposed on feeling creatures. In fact, they're just a minuscule fraction of it. Please don't lose the opportunity, Stephen continued, to point out that the food industry is hurting feeling creatures on a global industrial scale in numbers incomparably larger than primate experiments. Without a very clear statement of this fundamental background context, the considerations about philosophically motivated primate experiments risk sounding odiose. My talk, Stephen concluded, in contrast to all the other talks, which are about the causal role of feeling and evolution and function, is about how and why feeling matters. Qua feeling. And that, in a sense, is about how and why the subject matter of this summer institute matters. After receiving that response, I decided to modify my focus in two ways. I decided not to talk about the ethics of searching for neural correlates of social emotions in monkeys. I'm going to talk instead about the ethics of making monkeys depressed in order to try to prevent depression in women. Second, I decided not to skip over my concerns with animal agriculture, for Stephen is right. It cannot and should not go without saying at this meeting that pain is pain and frustration is frustration and suffering is suffering whatever their neural correlates, and whosever pain it is. And most animal pain and frustration occurs not in university laboratories, but in agricultural production facilities. 
here are some relevant statistics. In the U.S. in 2010, researchers used 30,808 non-human primates in experiments that involved pain and distress. In the same year, some 5 million sows were raised in the U.S., most of them in cages where they couldn't turn around. The sows gave birth twice that year to 100 million piglets. Most of the piglets spent six months on concrete slabs in small, unenriched pens, and then were crammed into trucks and taken to slaughter. For inquisitive, intelligent animals that crave social interaction, an existence in conditions that disallow exploring, bolting, nuzzling, or playing must be miserable. Perhaps compelling arguments can be given for raising animals for food in pre-industrial agrarian societies or in undeveloped economies. I doubt, however, whether those justifications will work for most people who live in developed economies, for almost all of us can enjoy luxurious feasts day in and day out without eating meat, even if you don't live in Montreal. Feelings matter, and the numbers of feelings matter. Viewed that way, it's worse, much worse, to participate in causing 100 million pigs to suffer for questionable ends than it is to participate in causing 30,000 primates to suffer for arguably good ends. Animal experimentation is but a small corner of the larger canvas of our exploitation of other species. And the best way to relieve animal pain and frustration is to become a vegan. Of course, it's not just animals we care about. We don't care properly about the humans we're supposed to care about. We too often neglect our family members and those we love, not to mention strangers in distant parts. So the challenge at the heart of animal ethics is considerable because it requires us to say how much we should value the interests of animals relative to our interests. To make progress on that question, I propose that we think about a particular example and the possibility of trading off a fair amount of animal suffering for a huge amount of human relief from suffering. The project I have in mind is at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, where monkeys are placed in conditions that cause many of them to exhibit the behavioral signs of, of social-induced depression. Researchers then look for the genetic, chemical, and neurophysiological causes of the change in mood. On its face, the experiment seems justifiable on utilitarian grounds. It's rigorously designed, supported by well-regarded research bodies in the United States, and approved by all of the regulatory bodies exercising oversight, including but not limited to the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, which every institution in my country has as a result of the Animal Welfare Act. And the goals of the research are salutary. Depression is nasty business. A major episode can kill you slowly through the accretions of the physiological side effects or quickly if you decide to take your own life. It's hard to imagine a stronger case for the use of non-human primates in painful research than the Wake Project, which may in fact be saving people's lives. But let's look closer. In 2002, the Wake Lab placed 42 female Sinomulgus monkeys Macaca fascicularis, crab-eating or long-tailed macaques, in solitary cages for three months. They use the species because, as Nelson and Winslow explained, primates have psychological capacities, cognitive skills, brain morphology, and social complexity that are all comparable to humans. As Willard and Shively note, the animal's depression resembles human depression in physiological, neurobiological, and behavioral characteristics, including reduced body mass, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis perturbations, autonomic dysfunction, increased cardiovascular disease risk, reduced hippocampal volume, altered serotonergic function, decreased activity levels, and increased mortality. After the three months of quarantine, the animals are moved into social groupings for a period of 26 months. During the second period, 16 of the 42 show signs of depression. In a second study reported in 2011, the lab housed 36 female macaques in single cages for up to 12 months, then housed them socially in groups of four animals for 15 months. 15 of those 36 animals 
became depressed. I'll skip the details of the study, but it's noteworthy that depression is not correlated with prior or current social status. Dominance became depressed as often as submissives. The results of the research demonstrate that social stress is physiologically distinguishable from depression, that depression is implicated in cardiovascular disease, impaired fertility, and low ovarian steroid concentrations. The clinical significance appears to be this. Primary care physicians should look for ovarian dysfunction in depressed women, something physicians, I read, are not presently doing. The reason they don't do it is because depressed women typically continue to have their menstrual cycles. If these results hold up, ovarian problems, difficult as they are to detect, may turn out to be the key to understanding high prevalence of depression in women. Now, what we want to know is whether the ends justify the means, whether trying to relieve her suffering justifies us in causing her to suffer. Whether trying to relieve her suffering justifies us in causing her to suffer. Your answer will depend on whether you think animals have moral standing, and if they do, how much. Did you all get a handout, by the way? So there's three main views about this matter. Speciesism holds that animals either don't have feelings, they're Cartesian clocks, or zombies. This is the view of Peter Carruthers in a famous article called Brute Experience, where he argues that animals have experience. They're all experiences. They're all just non-conscious experiences. Or that the animal's feelings are so simple that they matter not at all. That's Carl Cohen's view in another famous article on the use of animals in biomedical research. Utilitarianism holds that animals' interests are equal to the like interests of humans, and our actions should result in the greatest aggregate consequences of pleasure or happiness or satisfied desires. This is Peter Singer's view. Singer reaches conclusions like the ones I announced early in my talk about the consequences for how we should treat animals in agriculture. Ray Fry, who's also utilitarian, thinks the calculation works out the other way and that the pleasures people get from eating meat outweigh the pains to the animals. Everything hinges on the calculations for the utilitarians. But the point is that every sentient being's interests count equally with every other sentient being's interests, so you have to aggregate over humans and vertebrates, typically. Uh, given time constraints, I'm going to focus exclusive, oh, sorry, and animal rights holds that mammals have rights equal to ours, and we're never justified in treating a mammal as a means only to serve the utilitarian ends of humans. This is the view Tom Reagan defends in the case for animal rights. I'm going to uh, focus on the second view. It's fair to say, however, that our, the answer to our question is relatively straightforward on either the first or the third view. So if you're a speciesist, you're going to say, yes, go forward with the research, make her suffer to relieve her suffering. If you're an animal rights person, you're going to say, no, don't go forward with the research, don't uh, make her depressed in order to relieve her suffering. The uh, complicated, and I might say interesting view, is the second one. And now I'm going to give you the standard argument that we all just sort of assume is a good argument for defending the research. I'll call it the standard argument. It's a utilitarian argument, largely unstated. One, depression causes inestimable amounts of suffering in hundreds of millions of humans. The symptoms of depression you may know, and now I have to talk about this ugliness, encompass a range of negative feelings, from nonspecific distress, including intense sadness, grief, and anxiety, to utter hopelessness, lack of all interest or desire, unexplained fear, self-injurious self behaviors, and thoughts of suicide. It can be more or less severe. In its most dangerous presentations, it's marked by disturbed sleep, loss of all appetite and desire, dangerous feelings of unmerited guilt, and unremitting sadness and emptiness. Sufferers cannot manage their personal affairs. They find themselves unable to concentrate, maintain relationships with those closest to them, or hold a job. Worldwide, depression affects 121 million people annually. 
It's the leading cause of disease-related disability among women. Half of all US college students surveyed in 1987 reported experiencing it. Nearly 10% reported having considered committing suicides and starting college. 1% reported having tried to kill themselves. 36,909 people, that number will come back, 36,909 people killed themselves in the U.S. in 2009. For each successful suicide, approximately 11 people unsuccessfully try to kill themselves. So it's important, as uh, one of the speakers mentioned yesterday, that we keep in mind both uh, what we're looking the, what the brain's doing when we look for consciousness, but also what the target is, what the, what the object that we're trying to find in there is. And so now I want to uh, go a little bit further in explaining what that target is. Here's how one person, uh, I'll call her D, describes the feeling. When I'm depressed, I feel completely out of control. I feel I've failed those who love me. I fear the evenings because I'm afraid I'll be unable to fall asleep when I go to bed. I fear the middle of the night because I know I'll be worrying about the fact that I'm unable to sleep in the morning. And in the middle of the night, no noise goes unnoticed. The bullfrogs croaking, the tree limb brushing the window, the nails popping out of the siding on the house. Any sound, no matter how insignificant, reminds me of what a loser I am. I'm incapable of dealing with any of my problems. In the darkness, I don't just want the negative thoughts to go away. I want all inputs, good or bad, to cease. I want all inputs, good or bad, to cease. Now, I took the time to read this narrative because it's important that we understand what the feeling is, and it's a scary one. On any utilitarian ledger purporting to measure human suffering, depression, must be on the far end of the scale. So that's how depression feels to us, but how does it feel to the monkey? Who knows? What does it feel like to be a bat? If we could understand, if we could understand another species' feelings, we wouldn't be here in Montreal. But I'm supposed to tell you how it feels to the monkey, so let me offer five quick points toward that end. First, the animals are gregarious. Native to tropical forests of Southeast Asia, they naturally form groups, consisting of anywhere from a half dozen to several dozen individuals. Mothers have close, affectionate relationships with their offspring, which require long periods of maternal care. Severely stressed subordinate mothers are known to commit infanticide. Severe, uh, apparently, they're taking out on the animal, on the only animal under their control, their desperation over not being able to exercise any control in any other area of their life. The wake monkeys, therefore, come from a line of animals that have evolved to spend long stretches of time with each other, establishing and maintaining alliances. Second point, they like height, spending most of their time playing and swinging together 30 to 40 feet off the ground. They will come down to forage, dive, swim in rivers, according to one report, to fish. But they quickly return to their perches. They reduce agonistic encounters by going to different heights that reflect their place as dominant or subordinate. In this slide, you can see the hierarchy uh, uh, visually illustrated by the three layers of animals, those on the top, those on the railing, and then those on the deck. Third point, all animals in the wake study are adults. So they've come through the process of maturation. If we were talking about infants, we might be talking about animals with no feelings or very simple feelings. If we were talking about adolescents, we might be talking about animals that had only the vaguest sense of the social world around them. But these are adults who have mastered the ability to recognize instantly a face as friend or foe very interesting work at Emory uh, on face recognition by Lisa Parr. Um, and they've done this by interacting almost constantly. And they've done this by interacting almost constantly with conspecifics. Fourth point, the animals in the study are deprived of 
the activities that give them their identity. During the solitary phase, they can see, hear, and smell other macaques, but not touch or groom them. They cannot move to higher platforms when they sense danger. Fifth point, the animals in the study respond differentially to the stressors. About a quarter of them get so depressed during the solitary phase that they die. Others survive it and completely rebound. Others seem to have lasting psychological scars, engaging in stereotypies during and after the confinement. Apparently trying to relieve their fear and boredom, they pace, they rock, they backflip repetitively. They abuse themselves by biting their legs or plucking out their fur. They finally withdraw, some of them, about 40%, as in the picture, into a sort of fetal position. That's the best I can do to help you put yourself in the cage with the monkey and feel its depression. Is that as severe and complex as the feeling of human depression? It's nasty, but not as nasty, I submit, as some forms of ours. Let me explain. Monkeys, it appears, do not have theory of mind. Fill in theory of mind with whatever you think it is. That's not my interest at the moment. Uh, now, if that's false, I'm sure someone here will soon uh, correct me. I see people making their way to the microphone already. Uh, but monkeys, I will assume, don't have theory of mind. If that's true, their depression cannot include suicidal ideations. Suicide is the intentional ending of the life of an autobiographical being by that being. It requires not only self-consciousness, but other consciousness. If I feel social shame and humiliation, which is what shame and humiliation are, social emotions, I have to be able to take your perspective and from that vantage point see myself as beyond contempt. No non-human animal outside of those with theory of mind, probably some, maybe some of the great apes, can commit suicide. No non-human animal outside of those with theory of mind can commit suicide as long as I'm out on a limb here, I might as well saw it all the way off. What about the dog, you say, who stops eating and wastes away after its master has died? Unless it has the concept of its own psychological existence and aims at causally bringing about the end of that being's existence, it cannot and does not intend its own death. Nor does the tarsier commit suicide when it mortally bangs its skull against its cage. The dog and the tarsier may be grieving, anhedonic and depressed, I see no reason to deny that they have those feelings. But the death of the animal comes as an incidental byproduct of its behavior, not as the goal at which it's aiming. But of course, depression, even without suicidal thoughts, is awful. And I've called it on your handout, for lack of a better term, non-theory of mind depression. I see no reason not to think that the wake monkeys feel non-theory of mind depressed. The leader of the wake group seems to have no doubt about that matter, incidentally. It's really not rocket science, says Shively. It's that slumped, collapsed, collapsed body posture accompanied by a lack of responsiveness to environmental events. Am I saying that all human depression is worse than all monkey depression? No. It may be that some feelings of some depressed humans are very similar to those of the monkeys and not anywhere near as bad as those of the monkeys. Assume that some adults with autistic spectrum disorder cannot mind read. Can they nonetheless be depressed? Well, diagnosis with these patients is difficult, but the literature does report cases where physicians have diagnosed severe autistic patients with depression. If those people lack theory of mind and are depressed, then they may have the kind of feelings that the monkeys feel. So both monkeys and humans are subject to non-theory of mind depression, but theory of mind depression is reserved for autobiographical beings, aren't we lucky? Those who can think of themselves as continuing psychological presences in the world for, by definition, only uh, those beings can have the thought, I'd rather kill myself than continue to live in this hell of other people shaming me and making me feel guilty. The second premise of the argument is one to which I shall return. To relieve the suffering, we have to understand the causes of it scientifically and develop treatments. 
The third premise, is, premise acknowledges the moral rights of humans who lack theory of mind, the right not to be used in research against your will. These humans, we should note, would be, scientifically speaking, much better models of depression than the monkeys. Three, we're not justified in inducing behavioral signs of depression in non-depressed humans, even if the overall aggregated consequences of doing so are positive. Arguably, I think we actually could argue about this, maybe we will, we should not conscript one innocent human being into depression research, even if we could thereby eliminate all depression-related suicides. None of our most widely accepted ethical theories, or very few of them, utilitarianism, deontology, or virtue theory, contain principles that would lead to our proving such a practice. Now, the next premise is needed to say why it's okay to use monkeys in research. We are justified in conducting scientific experiments in which researchers induce behavioral signs of depression in non-depressed monkeys if the overall aggregated consequences of doing so are positive. This follows from the tenets of utilitarian theory. Now we come to the crux of the argument, number five. The overall aggregated consequences of inducing depression in monkeys are positive because experiments involve a relatively small number of animals. Compare the 30,000 primates to the 105 million pigs. The feelings of the animals are not as bad as the depressed feelings of humans, and the experiments lead to scientific explanations that bring enormous amounts of relief to a large number of humans. Premises 5A through C have great intuitive appeal. Curiously, however, no one ever seems moved, much less required by an IACUC, to actually defend them. I'm not aware of any explicit cost-benefit analyses that actually try to do this. I know of none from defenders of the, of the animal experimentation, like Carl Cohen, nor from its critics, like Peter Singer, Tom Reagan, or La Follette. So on the back of your page is a rank amateur's attempt, therefore, just to spell out what we all seem to be assuming if we accept premise five. There's two passes at the matter. The first assumes that the costs are the absolute numbers of monkey lives lost, that the benefits are the numbers of human lives saved, and that the life of a monkey is equal to the life of a human. If half of all of monkeys used in painful research in 2010 were used in depression research, that number would be 15,404. That's a generous number because the Wake Project uses 78 animals. If the research led to findings that saved half of all residents of the US from committing suicide, who would have committed suicide in the absence of the research, that number for 209 would be 18,454. That's a conservative number because most suicides, it appears, involve some form of depression. I'm just, we're just taking half of them. That's a ratio of 15 monkeys killed to every 18 humans saved, or 0.83 animal lives for each human life. Now, on a side, we might be tempted to give this number some context by comparing it to a throwaway ratio Tom Reagan once mentioned to illustrate his claim that the harm of death to a human is non-comparably worse than the harm of death to any animal. He wrote metaphorically, that if we were forced to choose between a human and a dog in a lifeboat situation, we ought to choose the human every time. And we ought to choose the human even if we had to throw overboard a million dogs. Had Reagan intended his ratio to apply to animal research, which he didn't, the Wake Project would look very good. It's killing less than one monkey, whatever that means. It's killing less than one monkey to save a human being. 0.83 to 1 is at least five orders of magnitude less than the Reagan ratio. Now, before you conclude that the Wake Project passes muster according to animal rights philosophy, I must add that Reagan himself would strenuously object to this comparison. His ratio only applies to lifeboat cases in which an observer is forced to choose between an animal and a human. In those cases, if the observer does nothing, both the human and the dog die. But the Wake Project doesn't meet these criteria, nor does any painful use of mammals in research, for these are not forced choice dilemmas. If the researcher does nothing, both individuals don't die. Only the human needing the research dies. The experimental animal lives. So we shouldn't think that the 0.83 to 1 ratio is justifiable on animal rights grounds. 
A second way to conduct this back-of-the-envelope analysis would be to convert the value of each life into monetary terms and then compare the results. Suppose that the research adds uh, 10 years of life to 18,454 humans. Suppose that the value of a quality-adjusted life year is 129,000. Assume further that each person gains an additional 10 years. If I've done the multiplication correctly, those benefits are about $24 trillion. And the costs? Value each monkey's life at the maximum amount it would take to replace the animal, or $8,000. Assume each animal, had it not been killed, would have had an additional 10 years of quality life. Again, if my arithmetic skills are up to the task, the total is approximately $1 trillion. Subtract the cost from the benefits, and you get a net economic benefit of $23 trillion from this research. I probably don't need to say that these two analyses reflect a methodology that's naive, overly simple, and not to be trusted. The method and the results are not to leave this room. But, <laughs> but I thought it would be worth trying just to articulate something to give us a sense for what it is that's operating in our assumptions when we so easily seem to be swayed by 5A through C. I hope that during the Q&A, you'll join me in exposing some of the silliness of the analysis. Uh, we come then to the final premise, uh, which presumably follows from 1 through 5, that we're justified in doing this research. Brief comments on the problems. I think there are good reasons to believe one, and I will grant three for the sake of argument, uh, but let's look in the time we have remaining at 2 and 5. Two. To relieve the suffering, we have to understand the causes of depression scientifically and develop treatments for them. Two promises more than it delivers. In fact, it suppresses the real premise that we actually need, which is seven, using monkeys in research is the only way to achieve the goal. That premise is false. If we have other ways of trying to acquire the knowledge, like mathematical and in vivo models, and if we have effective treatments for depression that aren't being used, and alternative strategies are available. Primary care physicians can diagnose the problem and address it at a reasonable cost using a combination of psychopharmacology, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and psychotherapy counseling. So while two is okay, I think, its suppressed premise seven is not. Now to 5B. 5B is false because of the argument from justice found in premise eight. We ought to weigh the depressed feelings of animals equally with the depressed feelings of humans without theory of mind. Humans with autism have a right not to be conscripted into depression-inducing research. And it follows from an Aristotelian principle of justice, the principle that we must treat relevantly similar cases similarly, that animals with the same mental capacities as severely cognitively limited humans have the same right. If we said otherwise and disallowed experimentation on people with ASD, while allowing it on animals with similar psychological skills, we would be guilty of judging the two cases arbitrarily. How am I doing on time? Five more minutes. We have five minutes left? No, you've got ten minutes altogether. But I have ten minutes altogether. I have more to say about the kind arguments, that the reason we can do this to monkeys but not humans is because humans with severe congenital cognitive impairments are of our kind, and the monkeys aren't. Um, but I will s address that argument in Q&A if you'd like. I'd like to reserve most of the time remaining for questions. The feelings of the animals we use in agriculture and research matter. How much do they matter? We don't have a good theoretical basis yet to answer that question in general. So we must evaluate each research project on a case-by-case -case basis. I've tried to move in that direction using the Wake Project as an example. A rough cost-benefit analysis of the project suggests the aggregated benefits are something like one monkey's life for one human's life or $22, $23 trillion net economic benefits, if you want to think that way, which I don't. That whole game falls far short of the demands of fairness and consistency. Uh, and these give us good reasons to reject that way of thinking about the value of human or animal life. I've argued that the worst feelings of monkey depression matter less than the worst feelings of human depression. 
But even if the monkeys lack theory of mind and cannot suffer from suicidal ideations, they can suffer mightily nonetheless. It's difficult to put ourselves in those cages and feel what the animals must feel as they wait minute by minute for threats to pass. Minutes become hours, and hours stretch into days, and the threats don't pass, and there's no way out. There's no perceptible escape route. There's no route to a higher vantage point. Everything's blocked. No place to get covered. No company within reach. No promise of company coming into reach. There's no guilt there. There's no social humiliation there. There's no suicidal ideation there, I propose. No. But there is utter desolation, unrelieved desperation, eventually complete loss of all hope and desire. We cannot prove by pointing to neural correlates that monkeys feel as well as look depressed. But perhaps you join me in thinking that the feelings nonetheless are real. We cannot prove by pointing to the deliverances of a universally accepted ethical theory that putting monkeys into this condition is wrong. But perhaps you join me in thinking nevertheless that it is. Thank you. Can we have some-